Hello and welcome to our taster session on emotion coaching. My name is Nina and I'm one of the educational psychologists in Barnet. So today's aims are really to consider children's emotional development and needs and to understand and learn the steps of using an emotion coaching approach. This training hopefully uh, will last around 30 minutes um, and hopefully cover um, the basic ideas around emotion coaching for you. So emotion coaching was developed by Gottman in the 90s and at the time he really felt that child development theories and child rearing approaches focus very much on the behaviour of children as opposed to their underlying feelings um, and really helping children to understand those feelings and how they linked to their behaviour. Obviously things have moved on in society and I think there probably is an increasing awareness of mental health and emotional well-being um, but I would say particularly at this time uh, with the recent COVID-19 um, um, and the additional pressures that ha that has brought to families um, as well as to settings um, is really, really important to be thinking about emotional well-being um, and emotional regulation and how we can support that for children. remember nothing from today's session I would really um, appreciate you remembering this slide and um, generally when children are finding a skill different difficult we would tend to teach them that skill so if they can't read we would tend to teach them to read and um, if a child can't swim we would tend to teach them to swim if they can do a different um, academic skill for example multiplying again we would teach them that but if you think about the phrase if a child can't behave what do we tend to do and I think a lot of people would probably, in their first instance, respond by punishment or consequence. And the thing is, behaviour is like any other skill. It's something we need to help children to understand. We need to help children to understand their feelings and develop um, different strategies to manage those feelings and behaviours appropriately. Um, this approach is evidence-based um, and it can be used as a way to preempt or to respond to uh, what appears to be challenging behaviour. Um, and this is through helping children to understand their different emotions, um, why, they, why those feelings occur and how they can handle them. And if anyone's interested to see Gottman himself talking about um, his ideas around emotion coaching, um, please do take a look at the YouTube link. So Gottman's research showed that emotion coached children um, are more emotionally stable, so lots of uh, uh, ability to kind of regulate their feelings, not have those highs and lows um, through, through the day. Um, children are more resilient, so they're more able to bounce back in the face of adversity and respond to what's going on around them. They are able to achieve more academically. We know that if we're kind of caught up in our feelings, we can find it very difficult to focus. If we're finding it quite difficult to focus, it's likely that we'll be listening less and learning less. Um, children who are emotion coached are more popular. They're more aware of the feelings of others. They're able to be more empathic um, and be better friends to their peers. They have fewer behavioural problems because they understand what their feelings are and different ways of being able to respond to those feelings. And I've put in brackets, have fewer infectious illnesses. My understanding is that the links between um, emotion coaching and illness uh, maybe aren't so proven at the moment. However, it makes sense that if we are feeling less stressed, our immune systems are likely to be stronger and we're more able to fight off infections. On the flip side, children who do not have adults around them using the emotion coaching approach find it much more difficult to control their emotions and self-soothe. So they'll be much more reliant on those around them to help them to feel calm. And if they don't have these skills, they might find a different way to deal with their emotions and that, that way may not always be so appropriate. They are less aware of social cues, perhaps because they're a little bit more caught up in their own feelings more difficulties with schoolwork, likely to be um, linked to difficulties with concentrating, more trouble getting along with others, um, more behavioural problems, more stress-related hormones, similar to what I was saying before. So we can see that emotion coaching actually affects 
children in lots of different ways, emotionally, academically, and potentially also in terms of their health as well. That's why um, it could be a really useful intervention to know about and to use. We are expecting an awful lot from children um, and some of the lessons that we're expecting them to learn are not so intuitive. So we want our children to be able to read the feelings of others and be able to empathise with others. We want them to be able to delay their gratification and be able to control their impulses and be able ultimately to self-regulate and self-soothe. We're expecting them to be motivated and to cope when life throws uh, unexpected events and be resilient. Um, to be able to pay attention and also to know that you know whatever feeling they're experiencing it itself is not a problem but rather the behavior is something that we might need to look at so we expect them to do an awful lot and they won't necessarily know how to do this without us explicitly teaching them and that's where emotion coaching comes in just like a sports coach we're kind of that voice in their ear guiding them through these tricky processes and learning skills that they can use for the rest of their lives so why are we thinking about emotional regulation? Why is this important? And how, how is it that children find this area particularly difficult? Behaviour, any behaviour we see, is a form of communication. Um, there's a function to that behaviour. There's a reason why they are going with that behaviour. Um, and it might be that children have needs that are not met yet. And that those unmet needs might lead them to feel quite anxious. It might feel like a real threat. Um, to their survival um, potentially and that anxiety can then turn into other feelings but also other behaviours. Um, so when we see these behaviours we really need to question what is it about the environment or what is going on for that child that means that they are communicating those feelings in that way through the behaviour. What's the meaning behind that behaviour? What's that message? Um, and often when we see that children are failing to behave appropriately, it's that they're finding it very difficult to communicate those, those feelings and those experiences appropriately. Um, sometimes children will pick behaviours um, and it will seem to us that they are incredibly challenging behaviours. Um, our ability to react to our feelings is based on our experiences and the resources and skills that we have. And children, if in the past have used behaviours that have worked for them, even if they're not appropriate or particularly um, socially uh, useful, they might opt for them if they have nothing better to, to rely on. So really what we need to do is give them more experiences of managing those feelings um, and more resources, more skills, um, so that they know how to respond in the future. I put as a reminder about the behaviour iceberg. So sometimes um, what we see is just the tip of the iceberg. The behaviour we see is the bit of the iceberg sticking up above the water, but underneath the water will be so much going on for children. So we might see anger at the top, but actually underneath is really fear. Um, it's uh, questions about their identity, perhaps where they're fitting in, it could be worries. Um, there could be so much going on below the surface um, for those children. So we really need to remember that what we see is not the only thing that is there and really help the children to unpick how they're feeling about themselves or a situation. Most children are trying to solve a problem rather than be one. However, sometimes the ideas that they have around what they can do, a solution, are a little bit misguided. Sometimes they haven't quite got a sense of the actual situation, so they've kind of misunderstood, and sometimes they, they lack the skills. And really that's our job, to help them to understand the situation and also give them the skills to cope. It's also to, uh, useful to remember our brain and our habits um, kind of follow whatever we've done a lot will be more likely we'll do again in the future. So if children, as I said before, have learnt um, perhaps adaptive ways to respond, but not necessarily helpful, uh, if they've worked in the past, they'll try them again. Um, but what I would say is that hope is not never lost. We can always teach children a new skill. And if they experience success of using that skill and we encourage them to try it again next time, the more they use those new skills, the more likely they are to become habit and the more likely the brain is also going to form new neural pathways that will support them to make those choices in the future as well. 
So it's never too late to help a child go along that path, pick a new path and, and learn new strategies and approaches. And if you kind of want a bit more of the technicality about kind of how that is working, we all have memories of day-to-day -day interactions in our life. Um, and what we're really doing is accumulating schemas and scripts. So kind of those messages in the back of our head about how we're going to respond in that situation. And these will guide us and guide our actions. And based on our experiences of those, of those interactions or um, our responses to that environment, if they worked well, that will go into our memory bank and become the next guiding action for us when that situation arises again. So that's why it's called emotion coaching. We're not doing it for them. We're giving them those scripts and those schemas. So eventually children will be able to manage their feelings by themselves. They won't need the coach like by them sort of whispering in their ear and guiding them along. It's useful at this point to, to kind of explore why discipline um, won't work for some children. So discipline re relies on the pattern of there being impulses, ideas to do something, a thought about whether that's a sensible idea to go ahead with that impulse, and then the action. So the idea being, if you change the thought, the middle bit about whether the impulse is a good thing to do or not, um, through maybe a consequence or a punishment, then the behaviour will change. However, for some young people, there is no thought. They never developed that gap between the impulse that they had and their action because that thought process is reliant on a caregiver being really attuned to them when they're young and giving them feedback on, on their choices. So you know when a child is crawling along and they look back at you to see if whether they should keep crawling. If you smile, they, they keep going. And if you scowl at them, they might pause and come back to you. If there isn't an adult in their lives that is giving them that feedback on a multitude of different situations, they never learn to know whether to go for something or not. So they just go for it because there's no one guiding them. And therefore, there'll be no thought for them to change. So discipline won't work for them, which is why we need this emotion coaching approach. Not that it won't work for children who've had that as well. Um, in their lives and really what we're trying to do is move from this reliance on external regulation through sanctions and rewards to more of a sense of internal regulation and using an emotion coaching approach so those voices in our head those kind of schemas and scripts that guide us in the future when adults around us use an emotion coaching approach these are the messages that adults are really conveying the idea that we all have feelings, they're all okay, we need to recognise those feelings in ourselves and in others. The idea that, you know, it's not just experiencing those feelings in that situation, we're not alone. We're accepted, we're validated, we're supported, we're respected, we're understood. It's incredibly powerful to have someone in your life feel that they can give you the level of support where you feel understood means you, you don't feel isolated and alone. And this idea of empowerment, that even if we have these big feelings, it's okay because we feel strong enough um, and safe enough to be able to problem solve and think about what we can do to solve those big feelings. Um, what's important is we're teaching children feelings are okay, but sometimes we need to regulate our behaviour and respond in a constructive way. Really, emotion coaching is emotional first aid. Okay, it's what you do first, like you would in a med medical situation. You would go for the complicated treatment. Really, you'd be finding out what is going on with that person. Um, and the idea is that we, the first bit is really just empathising, being with that child and really understanding where they're at, rather than jumping to solutions. Because if we jump to solutions, we've got no firm basis really upon which to understand them and what's going on for them. So the idea is that we almost create like this power base, um, a create, create a safe haven, a sense of trust, sense of respect, acceptance, children feel strong enough and feel safe enough to be able to explore some big feelings that they might be finding really difficult. And really the idea is that we want to connect with children before we correct them and build that rapport before we reason with them. And once we have that relationship with them, we're able to really guide them along the journey of them helping, helping them to understand 
their feelings and how to regulate their feelings. It is important to remember that there's a lot of effort uh, required in this approach. It is not going to happen automatically and overnight. Um, children need a lot of guidance and a lot of empathy. Um, however, if you use this approach just 40% of the time, the research, the research suggests that this is good enough um, to make a difference. Um, so you might want to start slowly, start one step at a time, maybe even use it just for the times where things are going well. You're just using it to, to uh, reflect back onto a child how they're feeling um, and empathising and, and validating that experience before maybe using it in times where children are a little bit dysregulated and then moving on to times where maybe they're quite dysregulated. So you're not jumping straight in necessarily one step at a time. I think it's also important to know what emotion coaching isn't and what approaches can be less helpful in supporting children to understand their feelings. Um, and these come in three um, main areas. So we can have a disapproving approach, a dismissive approach, a laissez-faire approach. Um, and as I go through these, don't worry if you see yourself in some of them. They're quite natural responses. But the first step is just being aware that we use them sometimes. And as we said before, 40% is good enough. You will catch yourselves doing some of these some of the time. But what we're trying to do is create more of a shift towards an emotion coaching approach. So if we take these in turn, a disapproving style really is where um, feelings are seen as a sign of weakness, a lack of control, unconstructive. And I've used the word negative emotions because that's how the disapproving style sees it. My personal view is nothing is, is negative. Um, it's just about what we do with some of those feelings. Um, this approach really lacks that empathy that children require and um, quite critical, quite intolerant of some of these feelings. And really the idea is they want to get rid of these feelings um, either through discipline or punishment, really very much a focus on the behaviour rather than the feelings underlying um, those feelings, uh, sorry, the behaviour. And really it's more likely to view these feelings as, as um, manipulation or lack of obedience or a bad character. Um, this, this style tends to be motivated by the adult needing to control the situation, regain power, toughen the child up, a bit authoritarian. Um, so really it's kind of not giving space to those feelings and not giving space to empathy either. The dismissive style, um, slightly different stance, um, good intentions here. You know, want to make the child feel good, still uncomfortable with those negative emotions. Uh, they're being viewed as something that's toxic, maybe something you need to get rid of, um, and maybe through logic of distraction rather than really understanding what's going on for the child. Um, there's a thought that if we pay attention to these feelings, we'll make them worse, um, and maybe even make them last longer, which, you know, they would be viewed as very problematic because obviously we need to get rid of them as soon as possible. So um, instead, we're trying to reduce or minimise or make light of the importance. No big deal. Don't worry. That's life. You'll be fine. You may have even caught me saying, don't worry if you catch yourself doing one of these styles. And that's, to, you know, to demonstrate how easy it is to sort of slip into this dismissive style, even if you have good intentions. And often there's a motivation here really to make things better, to rescue, to fix. Um, rather than to help the child understand what's going on for them. And really when we're using these approaches, um, it's quite dissimilar to the emotion coaching messages, which is what you're feeling isn't right, or you haven't got the situation right, um, you mustn't feel this way. And what we're doing is not allowing the child to experience those feelings or giving them the opportunity to develop the skills to manage them. Um, what's concerning is therefore they might suppress some of those natural emotions and they won't learn to trust that those emotions might be warning signs to them that something's not quite right. We can also end up developing feelings on top of feelings. If we don't deal with our initial anxiety, we might feel guilt about the anxiety um, because we haven't dealt with the baseline um, feeling. So it's really important to kind of give space um, to children and their emotions to help them to manage their emotions as they come up so that we don't have a build-up of layers of emotions on top of each other. And the last approach is the laissez-faire approach, uh, probably encapsulated really well by the little cartoon on the bottom left. 
when little people are overwhelmed by big emotions, our job to share their calm, uh, to share our calm and not join their chaos. Because sometimes as adults, we can become overwhelmed by what's going on for the child and the emotions that are driving their behaviours. Um, and as adults, we can feel helpless, afraid and distressed. Um, we might feel really empathic, we're almost too empathic because we're not able to pull ourselves out of that and then give them some guidance about how, to, how they should manage their feelings. And then as a result, everything just escalates. Um, and really, I think that one of the great things about emotion coaching is it actually gives adults some structure. And I think it can be very difficult when you're faced with a child who is finding things very difficult to really know where to start. But this gives you those steps to help you to really respond um, and give you uh, a sense of empowerment and knowing how to help that child. It's really important, I would say, though, put your oxygen mask on yourself before you help the child. If you are feeling dysregulated, seek help get some support, a colleague, a friend, a family member, taking a moment. Because if you are feeling dysregulated, it will be really difficult to support the child in the most effective way. And it's okay to ask for help and it's okay to say that things are tricky. Um, and in fact, it's great modelling for children that they can also know that they can ask for help if they're finding things too hard. So just a bit of summary, really, emotion coaching gives that lots of empathy and lots of guidance, whereas the other approaches have varying amounts of empathy and guidance and not sufficient levels to really help children understand their feelings. So how do we do emotion coaching? So first step, obviously be aware of your own feelings. And these will be the skills that we are um, focusing on. So knowing wh why emotions are so powerful, empathizing, really key, active listening and building rapport, problem solving and scaffolding and long term. So these are the skills. Okay, so let's just look at the steps. Um, the first step is just in general to be aware of children's responses and emotions. Um, really important that we're just aware. We take time to kind of look at the children that we're working with or that we care for, kind of know what their normal behaviour and feeling repertoires are so that we can take sense of you know, when things are a little bit awry for them. We need to really take emotional times as opportunities for teaching. That connection before correction. When a child has, you know, is finding something really challenging, it's a perfect time to do some teaching and learning and really help them in the moment to understand what's going on for themselves. We want to ch help children recognise their feelings and um, we want to listen to them empathically and validate the children's feelings and then help them to hopefully verbally label their emotions and this itself calms the nervous system. There will of course be some children that are not able to verbalise their feelings, perhaps they are pre-verbal, perhaps they have special educational needs or perhaps the emotion has just got so great for them they've lost their words and I'll give you some ideas of some resources of how you can support their stage um, even if they are not able to communicate verbally. And then what we want to do is set limits on their behaviour, but at the same time, we want to help them to problem solve um, and think about what they could do differently next time. And again, Gottman's got um, some ideas on this and you can hear him go through the stages himself in the YouTube link below. I just found this on the internet from the Gottman Institute. I really liked it as a quick summary. Um, it might be something that you put up at home. It could be something you put up in your setting. Maybe you want to cut up each of the steps and put them on a lanyard so that you can, you've got them right there if you need them. Um, but I, I liked it because ultimately we are helping children to grow through this. We are watering them through emotion coaching so that they have the skills to grow strong in their life and whether whatever storms or um, experiences they experience um, when they're a bit older. Just another way of showing the same information. Children become dysregulated and our job as adults really is to recognise that and empathise with those feelings. We then co-regulate by setting limits on the behaviour of the child and then problem solve with the child or young person so that ultimately they are self-regulating. So let's go a little bit more detail into each of the steps. 
we want to recognize all emotions as being natural, normal, and not necessarily a matter of choice. Behavior is communication, as we um, mentioned earlier, and we're really trying to get into the head of that child, really mentalize them, take their perspective. We're looking for those physical and verbal signs of the emotion, and we're going to use words to reflect back how they might be feeling and help them to use those words as well. We're going to be empathizing and affirming and helping them to calm through co-regulation. And we perhaps might even be providing a narrative for what they've experienced as well. We're going to try and avoid asking why the child is feeling that way, because as we mentioned before, some children will not know why. Um, they won't have that thought in the middle between their impulse and action. It will have just happened. You know, there's children sometimes that you think, well, maybe they've been a bit thoughtless or a bit impulsive. But we can ask what happens so we can get more of a, an account of the situation, but try to avoid the why. So the key phrases that you might use at this stage are something like, I see or I notice, are you feeling? I imagine that feels like this, Am I, have I got that right? Are you saying, um, how does that make you feel? So really just opening that conversation about their experiences. And I really like this little acronym of WIN, I wonder, I imagine, I notice. I wonder if you feel frustrated, I imagine that would make anyone feel upset, I noticed you look happy about that. So again, you can use it for both positive situations and times where behaviours have escalated as well. So just some examples, it seems you're sad, um, that he's stuck his tongue out at you, must um, hurt your feelings when someone pulls a face, uh, it's not kind of face and it's okay to feel sad about that. Okay, just to give you an idea of how the phrasing sounds. Obviously you can have a look at these, stop the video and and pause it and have a look at these yourself. The next stage is we really want to make sure that we're feeling quite attuned with the child. So we might be getting down to their um, level, we might be making really good eye contact. We're gonna set the emotional tone because we have very clever brain cells called mirror, neur mirror neurons. And when they see a behavior in others, they fire in our brain as if we're doing that behavior ourselves and it helps us regulate our nervous system. So really, if you as the adult are talking maybe a bit slower, a bit quieter, really looking at that child, helping them feel that you're right with them, that you're not distracted, that can really, really help. And at this stage, we'll be thinking about what the goal was that the child was trying to achieve through their behavior, make it clear that the behavior that they were using is not okay, um, so that can't be accepted. But at the same time, we're really still um, validating those feelings. So for example, it might, it's really important in our family, we have kind hands with each other, with our things. It's not okay to hit people or break or throw things when we're sad. So still the acknowledgement that we're sad, it's just not okay to express it like that. The kind of key phrase is it's okay to feel this feeling, it's not okay to do this action. And when the child's calm, then we're going to be thinking about alternative ideas and approaches that they could use next time. What I would say is really important if you can, don't jump in, don't give them the strategies, see what they come up with. If they come up with something that you think might be unworkable, of course it's safe, it's fine, that's all part of learning that we make mistakes, we give something a go and we try again next time. Some children will not be able to come up with strategies, they might be quite new to this, they might be quite young, again they might have difficulties expressing themselves and you might give them some options, you could say next time you could try this or you could try this. So if someone pulls a mean face to you or breaks your leg in the future, what would you do? Or you need to either do this or do that. Which would you like? Okay, so you're empowering that child to feel like they've got choices, they've got options. As I mentioned before, here are lots of different resources that children might be able to access if they are not verbal or pre-verbal, or they've lost their words because they're finding that they're really emotionally dysregulated. Um, so just some different ideas um, and resources the inside out um, or for older children and put some ideas at the, at the end. You could base your discussion around characters and sort of say this character is feeling in this way, you know, 
is that similar to how you're feeling that kind of discussion you might be using role play masks and puppets you might be using emotions fans and scales and wheels you might be using resources from zones of regulation um, you might be using um, you know lots of different resources um, to help either children point to them uh, or maybe they can go and get them when they want to express something to you um, so you don't have to rely just on that verbal communication and you might want to have some calming activities ready as well just to support a child to get into that stage where they're receptive to have some of these discussions and think about future behavior as well so these are just some ideas there's an excellent book that has a lot of these emotion coaching ideas um, how to talk so kids will listen and how to listen so kids will talk by Fabian Maslisch um, and this is one of the cartoons from the book that I think really um, expresses emotion coaching um, principles really well. So there's a little girl and her turtle has died and her father um, finds it quite difficult to emotion coach. Uh, he tries to deny those feelings, don't get so upset. She starts crying, so don't cry, it's, it's only a turtle, quite dismissive perhaps. Um, says so stop that, I'll buy another turtle. So really finding it difficult to manage her crying. Um, and then finding her quite unreasonable and they sort of end up quite apart in this so there's that opportunity for building rapport and connection has sort of been lost in the way that the father has responded however if we take the same scenario he's right there oh no what a shock really thinking about how she might be feeling about the loss of a turtle which might seem insignificant to him but really putting himself in the head um, and experiences of that child and you know if you're finding it difficult to empathize with you know a child whose brick lego brick has been taken just imagine if it was your piece of chocolate you know how possessive you would feel and how difficult you might find that to manage and that's really what we need to do be right there in that moment with that child so she says i taught him to do tricks you two had fun together so we're calling those memories i've shared experience he was my friend Pleasing a friend can hurt. So he's really showing that he's listening to her, he's looking at her, he's right at her level. He really cares about that turtle. I fed him every day. So he's really taken that opportunity to form that connection with her. And as a result, it kind of let lead um, lead to an ending to this little scenario feeling more close, even though obviously the child has experienced a loss. So really just to summarise, emotion coaching is about talking to children about emotions, helping them to label and express their feelings, respecting and accepting where the child's at, discussing the situations that led to that and having goals and strategies to cope in the future. It's about teaching children in that moment, giving them strategies, accepting all of those feelings um, and building those trusting and respectful relationships from which you can build and develop an awful lot more. If anyone's interested in further training or workshops that we can tailor to your setting, your cohorts, please do contact your link educational psychologists and they will be able to um, discuss that with you. Um, also, emotioncoachinguk.com is a great website for some further ideas and resources as well. Um, just uh, a few books that um, participants previously have shared um, that we thought would be really helpful for you to know about. Um, so these can be really um, supportive in helping children to express themselves and start off those conversations. Um, so obviously you can pause the video for yourselves um, and have a look um, at these if you would like to. Thank you very much for joining us today. And don't forget that you are your best resource. You've got all the skills that you need to support children with their emotional regulation. So lots of love.